During the second half of the 19th century, Russian radicals had not been immune to the currents of revolutionary ideas sweeping across Europe. Socialists and anarchists had placed their faith in ideas of peasant agrarian communism, drawing upon the ideas put forward by thinkers like Herzen and Chernyshevsky. However, this movement had never produced a genuine revolt. Time and time again, the peasants proved suspicious of urban elites and their ideas. They had shown themselves unwilling to organize in line with radical expectations, and more often than not, the dense theorizing of revolutionary socialists had little importance to those concerned with more immediate concerns of land and rural poverty. Over the years, radicals lost faith in revolutionary populism. Yet they did not lose faith in the hope of general revolutionary change altogether. A different method was simply required, and to some, Marxism offered just such an alternative. During the 1880s, leading Russian political exiles took up Marxist ideas. In particular, it was Georgi Plekhanov, a populist turned Marxist who began to urge his colleagues to reconsider their position. For Plekhanov, anarchist conspiracy tactics and hopes of rural revolution were not the path forward. The future belonged to industry and the urban proletariat, and in this respect, Marxism was the quintessential revolutionary doctrine to follow. As Plekhanov claimed, the Russian Revolution will either succeed as a workers' revolution, or it will not succeed at all. Plekhanov was the face of a small but dedicated Marxist faction, taking shape amongst Russian exile circles in the late 19th century. For all their confidence, however, Russian Marxists had to admit that Russia appeared an odd choice for a Marxist-style proletarian revolution. Russia hardly fit the mold of a modern industrial society. It had no bourgeois class to speak of. The empire had only begun to modernize its economy and infrastructure. Given this situation, how were workers expected to have the proper class consciousness to enact a proletarian revolution? Moreover, Plekhanov and his followers did not have ample opportunities to spread their message. Hounded by the Russian political state, they were forced to migrate abroad and keep up their struggle. Dissidents migrated between safe havens in Switzerland and Germany, engaging in debates within a small, close-knit group of exiles. In this situation, rarely did activists have a strong influence on matters back home. Nonetheless, in 1898, emigre intellectuals banded together in the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, forming an organizational body that would provide the nucleus of a small, dedicated cadre of Marxists committed to fomenting proletarian revolution in Russia. While the party worked in exile, radicals never lost sight of events taking place back home. Moreover, at the turn of the century, growing unrest was beginning to offer a glimmer of hope. With strikes and labor agitation beginning to destabilize Russian cities, certain activists began to believe that Russia might be ripe for a Marxist-style revolution after all. In particular, this view was taken up by one of the leading emigre Marxist theorists, who, within a few years' time, would leave his mark on the Russian left. This was Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. By all standards, Lenin was a political firebrand. He kept abreast of leftist movements across the continent and watched with dismay as socialists began to take up a reformist platform. 
In his estimation, reform held little promise for real political change. Only an active and radical revolutionary program could be expected to bring down the autocratic czarist system. While critical of reformist socialists, Lenin also had misgivings about the state of Russian radicalism as well. At the turn of the century, a new generation of Narodnik socialists and populists was growing up in Russia, and these so-called socialist revolutionaries presented a challenge to Marxists. The SRs were making inroads among the peasants in the countryside, with promises of land reform and agrarian socialism. For Lenin, this reworked populism threatened to reduce the influence of the urban proletarian classes and undermine the appeal of Marxism itself. While thinkers like Plekhanov and Lenin shared certain ideals and possessed a common ideological basis, by the late 1890s, the Marxists had become divided along certain lines regarding questions of organization and strategy. With strikes breaking out in Russian cities, it began to seem that an independent workers' movement and party was growing up in Russia. These worker movements certainly shared desires for social change with political exiles, but they were by no means controlled by the Marxists per se. The question was how to respond to these developments, and this question became a crucial test of Marxist unity. In other words, what was to be done? And on this question, a variety of opinions came forth. Julius Martov, a close associate of Lenin, looked favorably upon the recent wave of strikes and worker activity in the country. As he saw it, worker organization clearly demonstrated that the Russian workers were becoming class conscious and aware of their common struggle against the bourgeoisie. This revelation held out the prospect of creating a mass political party based around Marxist principles capable of drawing workers together. In many ways, Martov was proposing a mass party similar to those of the socialists in France and Germany. With the support and participation of workers, Russian socialists could see through a social revolution in the country, putting an end to the czarist autocracy and the capitalist system that oppressed industrial labor. Lenin, however, presented a counter view. In 1902, he published a pamphlet entitled, What is to be done? In it, Lenin outlined a revolutionary program of action that was quite distinct from the one proposed by Martov. In his estimation, it was imperative to form a party composed of professional revolutionary, one that would effectively overthrow the state and guide the worker movement. Given these differences in outlook, it was evident that two competing visions of Marxism were emerging. In 1903, a series of congresses were held by the Russian Social Democrats in Brussels and London. These congresses were expected to unify the party platform and iron out the differences arising between radical activists. In actuality, however, these meetings proved to be counterproductive to this goal. At the Congress, Lenin outlined his course of action and laid down strict criteria for party membership. His policy was broadly one of democratic centralism, outlining a method of organization that assigned all decision-making to the party leadership. Upon listening to Lenin's proposal, Martov and his followers became suspicious. They believed that Lenin sought to take complete control of the party and suppress all internal debate effectively making his plan the only course of action. Yet when it came time to vote on which direction to take, it was Lenin's platform that passed by a slim majority. Henceforth, 
the Leninist camp assumed the title of Bolsheviki, or the majority. Those who supported Martov were deemed Mensheviki, or the minority, effectively splitting the party into two camps. Learning of this outcome, the Mensheviks were irate. In a private letter, Plekhanov readily compared Lenin to Robespierre. Other critics were not as reticent in their accusations. They compared the Bolsheviks to a Jacobin club and warned that if nothing was done, an impending radical dictatorship would be on the horizon. It helped that Lenin himself espoused the label affixed to him by his enemies. A Jacobin who is inseparably linked to the organized class-conscious proletariat is a revolutionary social democrat, Lenin fired back defiantly. If he was to be branded a Jacobin, then the Mensheviks were nothing more than perfidious Girondins. Recriminations of this nature were slung back and forth in the following months, accenting the divisions that were threatening to splinter the Russian Marxists. More importantly, this split took shape just as Russian society seemed poised for a revolutionary outbreak. With the unrest of 1905 reaching ahead, it appeared Russia was on the verge of revolt. Sadly, it was one which the Social Democrats were ill-prepared to lead. The events of 1905 had been met with enthusiasm by exiles abroad. They extolled the strikes and mutinies in the press and made bold predictions about what was to come. Yet because the Marxists were abroad, they played only a minimal role in the agitation. They had few means of influencing protesters or events on the ground. When Bolshevik leaders finally did begin to return to Russia that summer and fall, they were forced to adapt to the situation already underway. Bolsheviks set to organizing worker battalions in the factories. They participated in the worker councils or Soviets that had grown up in the cities. They ran newspapers and attempted to win workers over to their Marxist agenda. Yet their influence paled in comparison to the independent worker unions and groups leading the protests. In October, the Bolsheviks were among the group who rejected the October Manifesto, urging protesters and workers to keep up the resistance. When the autocracy began clamping down on the opposition, leading Bolshevik organizers in Moscow reacted. That December, they took control of the Moscow Soviet and ordered workers to seize immediate power. In this call to arms, Bolshevik organizers declared a resolute and merciless war upon the aristocracy in the name of the revolutionary proletariat. Worker militias were quickly organized and armed. While the bands of armed workers could hardly be expected to seize the state, Organizers expected that once this revolution was underway, soldiers would mutiny and workers would stage mass strikes in support of the uprising, giving it a chance. In reality, however, the insurrection quickly dissolved into a fiasco. The Bolsheviks had little experience in leading an insurrection or organizing troops. In total, the Moscow Uprising lasted a mere week. By its conclusion, Tsarist forces managed to suppress the revolt and began rounding up and arresting the Bolshevik conspirators. Realizing that all was lost, Lenin fled to Switzerland. The Bolshevik bid for power had been an abysmal failure. However, 
If the radicals had lost out in 1905, they were not defeated. In exile, they licked their wounds and began to regroup. Lenin remained engaged in conspiratorial politics. He led an émigré opposition from abroad and participated in international socialist movements. He also continued to publish pamphlets and further elaborate his vision of communism as well. In fact, this period of exile was quite fruitful and marked a transformative period in Lenin's thinking. He began to reflect critically on the possibility of social revolution in Russia, and he began to turn his attention to the Paris Commune, presenting it as a potential model for action. The Commune, with its decentralized organizational structure and socialist ideals, appeared to resemble the worker Soviets that had taken shape in 1905. Yet the lessons from the Commune were equally valuable in Lenin's estimation. Smashing the bourgeois state, rather than simply appropriating it, ought to be the goal of revolutionaries, Lenin believed. This is precisely what the Communard of 1871 failed to do, and as a result, the Commune had ended in failure. If given the chance, Russian revolutionaries would not make the same mistake, Lenin insisted. In almost every way after 1905, Russian radicals were biding their time. They were waiting for the next moment of crisis and refining their strategies, and they would not have to wait long. As the new decade commenced, crisis seemed to loom everywhere. In 1914, Europe slid into one of the most devastating conflicts in modern military history. Over the next four years, war would claim roughly 17 million lives, leaving European society devastated by its conclusion. However, the First World War had consequences far beyond the battlefield. As the conflict dragged on, states were compelled to reorganize almost every aspect of economic, social, and political life. In order to wage what became deemed a total war, governments were compelled to mobilize all available resources. Between 1914 and 1918, states placed exceptional controls over industries to manage wartime economies. Military authorities took charge of civilian affairs, replacing politicians and other governing authorities. By 1918, state administrative capabilities were left significantly enhanced as total war encouraged bureaucratic restructuring and reorganization on a vast scale. In no uncertain terms, the First World War ushered in a radical economic, social, and political transformation across Europe as states mobilized and organized men and resources for the defense of the homeland. Between 1914 and 1918, societies became overtly militarized, and this created a new context and mindset that would have an impact on things to come. In 1914, as international tensions reached a breaking point, Russia went to war with Germany and the Ottoman Empire. To say the least, the war effort went badly for Russia. The Russian army was ill-equipped. The state was not suited for the new style of industrial warfare and, thanks to the German-Ottoman alliance, the Tsarist government found itself fighting a war on two fronts, one in the Caucasus against the Ottomans and one against Germany in Eastern Europe. By 1917, 
German forces had pushed into Russia's western borderland, taking control of the Ukraine, Poland, and the Baltic states. As early as 1915, imperial authorities were forced to evacuate populations from these areas to prevent them from falling under German control. Some six million refugees flooded into the Russian heartland, generating a massive refugee crisis that destabilized the empire. This crisis, moreover, occurred behind the backdrop of food shortages, war rationing, inflation, and growing unemployment, all of which were taking a toll on the general public as the war continued. The demands placed on industries to fulfill the war effort did not help matters. Civilian sectors were typically forced to go without goods and services as all resources were channeled into the war effort. In general, the war was a catastrophe, one that the autocracy seemed unable to deal with effectively. By early 1917, there was a growing sense that the war might be a lost cause for Russia. Even if it wasn't, people began to question whether Tsar Nicholas was up to the task of defending the empire. In February, bread riots broke out in Petrograd, leading to a general worker strike as hungry laborers took to the street. To make matters worse, the troops garrisoned in the capital refused to put down the strikes when ordered to do so. Tired of the war and shortages, troops disobeyed their commanding officers and joined the demonstrators. In turn, radicals and liberals exploited the unrest, seeing a window of opportunity to agitate and press their demands, only adding fuel to the fire. Consumed with the war effort, the state proved powerless to shut down the opposition. With the war going badly and discipline breaking down in the military, Tsar Nicholas was in a quandary. With few alternatives, Nicholas turned to his advisors for counsel. What they proposed was hardly optimistic. To quiet the unrest and restore trust in the government, it was evident in their opinion that Nicholas would have to step down. In late February, Nicholas deferred, abdicating his throne. In this stunning series of events, it was clear that the autocracy was collapsing. And yet there was little consensus on what might replace it. If this power vacuum was not filled, it could leave the door open for more insidious forces to seize the initiative. Moderate liberals and property owners realized that inaction would be fatal. And therefore, as the political crisis continued, they decided to act. A new government had to be created. The autocracy was finished, they argued. And in no uncertain terms, a revolution was clearly underway in Russia. Although historians often speak of the Russian Revolution, the events that would take place in 1917 were in fact two revolutions. A constitutional liberal one carried out in February, which would be followed by a more radical one the following October. As the Tsarist regime buckled under the strain of war and protests that February, Moderates and liberals found themselves in an unexpected position. They had to form a government, and they had to do it quickly. To this end, liberals and progressives banded together into a faction which took the name of the cadets. Their strategy was straightforward. They wanted to gain a leading role in the creation of a new provisional government. What they did not want was to allow the protest movements to seize the initiative 
and push through a radical reform policy. Under the chairmanship of the age-old liberal Prince Lvov, a provisional committee began quickly ushering through a series of reforms aimed at founding a new regime and winning popular support. The committee passed a string of legislation over the coming weeks that allowed for civic and political rights, universal suffrage, and a general amnesty for political exiles. Plans were made for a constituent assembly that would draw up a constitution and crown the great Russian revolution, as Lvov claimed. After years of paralysis, Reform now assumed a rapid and dizzying pace. Yet it was primarily directed by political elites, who had simply assumed power. Nobody had elected them to act, and this lack of a popular mandate left the legitimacy of the new provisional government in doubt until a constituent assembly could be elected. This situation was hardly ideal, but under the circumstances, Liberals had few options at their disposal. For their part, workers and radicals took to organizing themselves. As liberals passed laws, those outside the new government began setting up Soviets. These councils were self-directed. They were intended to guide the strike movements, organize protests, set up citizens' militias, draft petitions, and serve as a voice for what was now being called the toiling masses. The Soviets were democratic organs and were hailed by supporters as the embodiment of revolutionary democracy. Each one was elected directly by members and each tended to represent their own factory, town, and constituency. Even soldiers tired of military authority began setting up their own Soviet, calling for the democratization of the armed forces and an end to the war. By the autumn of 1917, some 900 Soviets had been set up throughout the empire, encompassing workers, soldiers, and peasants. While liberals looked askance at these overtly democratic and autonomous political councils taking shape, there was a larger question to consider. It was uncertain whether or not these Soviets would in fact support a moderate liberal government, generating a problem of how to respond to these forms of democratic organization. For starters, the newly created war ministry had promised the Allies that Russia would continue the war effort. This was a very unpopular decision with workers and soldiers, who were now calling for peace, and the Soviets immediately let this be known. Evident in all of this was the fact that the February Revolution had produced two poles of power and legitimacy. On one side was the provisional government that lacked a popular mandate, and on the other were the various Soviets claiming to represent the people Dual power became one of the major challenges of the newborn revolution, and it was one that liberals were going to have to contend with if they intended to crown this Russian revolution with a constitutional regime. In order to mollify popular demands, the cadets reasoned they would have to offer certain concessions to the worker parties in an effort to win them over. These concessions took the form of positions within the government ministry, inviting representatives of the left to join the provisional government. The Mensheviks and other radicals accepted the offer. They believed they could push for democratic reform from within the government as a minority party, steering the revolution in a more socialist direction. The Bolsheviks, however, flatly refused, insisting they could expect nothing from a bourgeois government. Hedging their bets, the Mensheviks accepted the liberal olive branch, 
effectively dividing the left. In their speeches and writings, they encouraged workers to support the provisional government. Political participation would, Mensheviks insisted, give the left a newfound political leverage and show the error of Bolshevik intransigence. This assessment, however, would prove inaccurate. The government's attempt to reach out to the left had primarily been the work of Alexander Kerensky, a socialist revolutionary who had thrown his lot in with the provisional government. Kerensky was a lawyer and verified leftist. He was eloquent, pragmatic, and he possessed a flair for dramatic speech making. More importantly, he was popular with workers and the liberal-minded intelligentsia alike. His support had given a boost to the government in March, and by the spring, Kerensky was already one of the leading figures within the Provisional Committee. Many hoped that Kerensky would prove to be a unifying figure, who could rally the nation around a new constitution and recast the floundering war effort as a patriotic and national cause. Yet even if Kerensky did seem a somewhat popular choice, his government faced an uphill battle when it came to workers and the left, and winning their support was not an easy task. However, it wasn't just the workers the state had to contend with. The February Revolution had also animated peasants in the countryside. Like workers, they were concerned with rationing and food, yet their complaints stemmed from a different source. The military had placed high demands on comestible goods during the war. Most of the grain harvested in the countryside was shipped off to the cities to feed workers involved in the war industries. Shortages were more severe in the countryside, and for peasants, it began to seem that the cities were draining all of their resources. Here again was the old rural-urban divide, and under the circumstances, such divisions assumed new political overtones. In addition to the problems generated by the war, peasants had their own demands. They wanted land and an end to the debts owed to the rural aristocracy. Agrarian reform, or solving the problem of rural poverty and land shortage, was, for peasants, more important than social reform. This too marked a sharp difference between peasant agitators and urban protesters. Socialist revolutionaries had been active in organizing peasant communes and politicizing them. By 1917, activists were busy setting up Soviets in the countryside, articulating their demands and turning them into a political force that liberals found difficult to ignore. Something would have to be done in order to stabilize the situation, and as events progressed, the government saw the political necessity of committing itself to a policy of land reform. In reality, the government preferred to leave the issue of land unaddressed for as long as possible. The countryside was vital to grain supplies, and the state did not intend to do anything to disrupt it. Therefore, the provisional government decided not to take sides in disputes between landlords and peasants. It gave tepid promises of reform, but did nothing to act on them. As a result, landowners and peasants became increasingly disillusioned with the government. Consequently, they began to look elsewhere. By the late spring of 1917, it was clear that support for the government was clearly diminishing as events progressed. 
the Soviets proved reluctant to wholly endorse the liberals, indicating a strong mistrust for unelected political elites who might attempt to undermine the democratic activism underway. On the other side, failure to take a stance on the issue of land reform had only served to alienate peasants and the aristocracy. On top of these troubles, a political scandal arose that summer that placed Kerensky in a precarious situation. The scandal centered on one of Kerensky's key appointments, the conservative war minister Lav Kornilov. As a military commander, Kornilov had supported staying in the war. To renege on Russia's wartime allies would not only be a disastrous embarrassment for the government, he believed, it would permanently blemish the government's reputation, holding it directly responsible for losing the war. Kornilov was also convinced that the worker Soviets posed a significant threat to the new government as well. If they were allowed to continue, they would certainly throw Russian society into a state of revolutionary anarchy. In his opinion, taming the Soviets was essential to the security of the new government. In mid-August, it was learned that the general was secretly conspiring with conservatives and counter-revolutionary groups to move against the Soviets. Kornilov planned to carry out a violent coup d'etat, rally the military, and strike a blow against all radical organizations. In no uncertain terms, he intended to dismantle the Soviets and be done with them for good. When this plan was leaked, worker support for Kerensky's government dried up. Faith in the government had been irrevocably shaken. More significant though, the crisis reflected negatively on the Mensheviks as well. Having joined the provisional government, they had tied their fate to it. With the government now seen as counter-revolutionary, the Mensheviks were left completely discredited. And this now left only one party for workers and the left to rally behind, the Bolsheviks. As the provisional government floundered, dual power was quickly coming to an end. And this situation left the Bolsheviks in a strong position, one that they could not fail to exploit. <laughs>